poll right now. I've got some questions for you. So I need to count. My question is, how many of you here, remember you need to raise your hand, if you have never had a problem in your life? I want to see your hands, come on. Who has never had a problem in their life? Lisa? You've never had a problem? <laughs> I'm just giving you a hard time, but your hand was up. I've got x-ray vision, actually hot eyes. Anybody, how, how many of you seem to have problems every single day? Let me see your hands. Okay, come on, be honest. I'm sorry about that. How many of you have problems, maybe weekly or occasionally? Let's see your hands. Yeah, I have to raise my hands on this one. Yeah, probably once a week at least. Did you vote? She's just so positive that I didn't know. I thought maybe you wouldn't raise your hand for anything. But you know, I'm not meaning, I don't necessarily mean problems. Take, he raised that last comment. Thank you. So most of us, right, most of us do face problems, challenges, Hard times, struggles, pain, sadness, depression. You know, most of us have that. We can't avoid it. That's just part of life. You know, everybody says, well, that's just life. And it is. A lot of people use their time then to pray, to pray for God to remove their problems. And that's good, because we are supposed to pray. God wants to see us. <laughs> God wants to hear us. God wants us to communicate with God. But a lot of people say, oh, God, help us get rid of our problems. We want everything to be smooth as silk. We want everything to be perfect. We want to have optimal health. We want to have plenty of money. We want friends by the scads. We want to be happy and joyous all the time. And we all want that, right? So we pray and pray and pray for those things. But sometimes I truly think that our problems are good for us. They help us to grow spiritually. They make us better people. They make us a better mother or a better father, a better person in general. They make us work harder. They make us appreciate more, right? Now, if you're broke and you're hungry and you get some food, you really appreciate that food and whatever you get, right? Some of us have experienced poverty. You know, I lived in poverty before, and I know the taste of that. And I know it's not fun. And whenever I would get something, I was so appreciative. So I think, and I truly think, that sometimes I get nervous saying this because I don't want to have problems. But I really think that problems can be good for us. Does anybody else agree here? Let's see your hands. Anyway, it's hard to say. But sometimes I can see really clearly in myself and in each of you. You know, when we are discussing your problems and other people talk about their problems, sometimes I really can see so vividly how God has taken your biggest and worst problem and transformed it to become something great in your life. Sometimes I can see that so clearly. And it's so nice that you can become something greater. And that's a result of your horrible or bad experience. So you can do something great because of your bad experience previously. God can take that bad experience or bad situation and create within you something magnificent and amazing. I have to share with you a couple of times, you know, when I'm trying to warm up with my church family, and I have shared with you, you know, that I am a survivor of domestic <coughs> abuse when I was growing up, and I'm a survivor of domestic violence as well. And I know for sure 
there's no doubt in my mind, I know that God took those experiences of my childhood and my experience of domestic violence to create something new in me. It was, wasn't me that created something new, it was Christ in me. And that gave me my compassion, my concern, my um, avidness to adopt children. <laughs> Because I know what it feels like to not have a mother or to have a mother who is abusive. And so that really is, was the impetus for me to adopt. That bad spirit experience was created to be in me to create compassion and mercy for people. And that comes easily to me now. Now if I hadn't experienced those bad experiences coming up, maybe I would be different today. Maybe I would not be adopting. Maybe I wouldn't want eight children. Maybe I wouldn't be a pastor. I don't know. But those experiences, I can see clearly that God took them and created something entirely new within me. Now, I don't want to experience abuse or domestic violence again. I never want to experience that again. However, when I stand back and look objectively, I think, wow, how cool is this? I'm so glad, not for the experience, but I am so glad for the power of God to take those experiences and create, use them, and create something new within me. And I see that happening in your lives too, as well as my own. So that's what leads me to say that sometimes I think problems are good for us. Now, whatever you've experienced in your life, or whatever you will experience in your life, I want to show you some scripture that can help you feel more positive. Now, I read that when I was reading this and studying it yesterday, and again this morning, I always feel so much better when I hear this particular passage from Paul. I love this. And I always feel better when I meditate or study on it. And I want to share it all with you. This is from 2 Corinthians chapter 12, verses 2 and 3. 2, 3, and 4. And Paul is saying, it's kind of, it's a little bit vague at the beginning, but you'll get it by the end. But Paul is saying, I know a man in Christ who 14 years ago was caught up to the third heaven. Whether it was in the body or out of the body, I do not know. God knows. And I know that this man, whether in the body or apart from the body, I do not know. But God knows. He was taken up to paradise and told things he didn't understand. Things that no one was permitted to disclose. So Paul is talking about himself when he says, I know a man. Let me... Really, he, he was speaking of his own experiences. But he wanted to be humble. He didn't want the attention to be on him. He didn't say, hey, I did this and I did that. He wanted to be discreet about it. So he talked about another man over there who was taken to heaven. Whether within his body or outside of his body, he didn't know, but he was ascended. And he was remembering, he was being vague about the time. Because you should remember when Paul used to be Saul. And so about 14 years ago was when he changed from Saul to Paul. So, you know, people say, what the heck is the third heaven and all that? Well, we do know that there is heaven and there is earth and there is hell. And that's all that we need to really know. So anyway, this is about Paul. And verse 5 says, can we move to verse 5, please? Can we move to the next slide, please? Verse 5 says, I will boast about a man like that, but I will not boast about myself, except about my weakness. So Paul's starting to open the gates to his explanation. Because once again, Paul is speaking about someone else. And this is a huge lesson for us because Paul was trying to be humble and discreet 
So he kept saying, hey, I know a guy, I know a man. And maybe we think that's kind of weird. I mean, why, does, why don't you just go ahead and say that you're talking about yourself? But what I take from this is that we should never, ever judge anyone based on what they do or what they say or what to keep themselves pure. Don't judge or criticize or say they are weird. You have to do this? That's weird. No, because everyone does what they need to do to keep their focus on God. And a lot of people will do things that you may not personally agree with, but that's okay. Maybe people will say things that you don't agree with, but that's okay. Maybe a person will say they never ever will take a drop of alcohol. Well, and maybe that they have alcoholic tendencies. So people do whatever they need to do to keep their relationship with God intact. And we should never judge them. Now verse six says, even if I should choose to boast, I would be a fool because I would be speaking the truth, but I refrain so no one will think more of me than is warranted by what I do or say. And Paul keeps referring to someone else because in Paul's time, he was preaching in two different towns. So, and people often thought that Paul and Barnabas were the same person. And so they, they, they thought that they were actually being, were giving up and being sacrificial. And that concerned Paul a lot because he wanted to see the attention being on God, not on what he was doing. So he was always trying to direct people to God. So he was saying, don't look at me, look at God, look at what God is doing. So often when things weren't going well, sometimes, or when things aren't going well, we tend to get a little arrogant or conceited, don't we? We think, well, I'm doing so great. I've got money coming in really well. My work has taken off. My family's being successful. I am happy, happy, happy. Everything is fabulous. And we get a little content and arrogant about that, don't we? We start to think that we're independent from God. You know, I see that happen every day within the church. I see people who leave the church when their lives are going smoothly. I see it. You know, we do the same thing today. When everything's smooth and we don't have any obstacles or any challenges, we tend to become complacent. We think that we can be successful without God, and then when a problem or an issue comes up, we run back and depend on God and ask for help and repent, right? Well, Paul was having the same situation in his time. He said, you know, I am doing all this not for people to look and worship me at my sacrifice. I am not going to be boasting about what I do any longer because we need to remain humble and dependent and related even when things go smoothly. And we know when things do go smoothly, it's not because of anything we've done. It's because of God. When your life is going along really well, then you think you don't need God and you go along on your own, you're making a big mistake. It's just a big mistake. Now verse 7 says, now here's where Paul starts to be a little more prescription, prescriptive and tell us what to do. Verse 7 says, therefore, in order to keep me from becoming conceited, I was given a thorn in my flesh, a messenger of Satan to torment me. Now that thorn doesn't mean he really had a thorn sticking out of his side. It was a symbol. A symbol that Satan is real, that Satan works in our lives or tries to every single day. And sometimes maybe you'll have a thorn which could be a problem. Sometimes you get a thorn because God has decided in his divine appointment for that problem to arise. Sometimes you get a thorn from his divine permission 
Like with Job, remember? The devil wanted to torment Job, and God permitted that. So the thorn is the problem, and it can be given for a good reason. Now, research, researchers have found proof that Paul really did have physical struggles. He suffered. He had either colic, which is like acid reflux in my interpretation. If any of you have ever had acid reflux, it's no fun. It is not funny at all. You can't eat or drink without medication. And if you miss your medication, you can't eat or drink anything. You really become dependent on the medication. And imagine in Paul's time, they didn't have medication. So they think he either had um, acid reflux. And if you do seriously have acid reflux, you will be skin and bones because you can't eat without the um, medication. Other uh, scholars say that maybe he had gout, which is kind of like arthritis. He might have had swelling in his appendages or all over his body, and it would have been painful. And some folks think that Paul had a hearing problem. He had an ear problem, like ear infections that were chronic. Other theorists say that Paul had migraines. And if any of you have ever had migraines, you know how no fun they are. <clears throat> without any kind of medication, oh my gosh, you're probably throwing up. And you know, a lot of times even when you have migraine, you throw up the medication for it, and then you can't take any more medicine for a while. Other theorists say that no, Paul wasn't talking about physical afflictions, he was talking about people. Because there are some books of the Bible that talk about people as thorns in the side. But, and other groups of theorists say, no, that Paul knows that we've got physical, he knew he would have physical complaints and he would not ask for those to be removed. He knows that everybody has physical problems. That's just a, a common occurrence. And that he knows that people can be pains in the neck and that God, Paul would not ask for, people to, for those people to remove from his life. So what they think it is is that he was asking for God to remove Satan's torment with a variety of things that he was experiencing. Now in verse 8 it says, three times I pleaded with the Lord to take it away from me. Talking about the thorn, whatever his affliction was. He asked for three times. You know, three is a pretty magical number in the Bible. Father, Son, and Holy Ghost and all that. But he pleaded with God to take away whatever his problem was for three times. Maybe it was migraine. Maybe it was acid reflux. Maybe it was people picking on him. Maybe it was um, failure in his counseling, whatever it was. But he begged for three times for that to be removed, for his problem to be taken. And then in verse 9 it says, But he, meaning God, said to me, meaning Paul, my grace is sufficient for you. For my power is made perfect in weakness. Therefore, Paul says, I will boast all the more gladly about my weaknesses so that Christ's power may rest on me. Wow. Do you see that? God is telling each of you that even when you plead, that he wants you to know that his grace is sufficient for you. That his power can be seen through you. That his power can be seen through your responses. Whoa, life's tough. Life has a lot of problems that arise all the time. Maybe your parents aren't nice. Maybe men abuse women. Maybe you have financial struggles. Maybe your infant is jaundiced or has a terrible illness. There's all kinds of problems that arise and they're frightening. They're horrible, terrible. And I think I've told you before, my house was, had leaked for 
13 years. And it was horrible. I begged for God to help me with my house for 13 years of leaking. Can you imagine that? You know, we paid for it to get fixed and the leaks didn't stop. We paid multiple times for this to happen for 13 years. It was really horrible. Really a horrible situation. Because we paid for it to get fixed, we paid for the, the roof, had, um, the leaking had ruined the supports and it ruined the carpeting and all kinds of stuff. So we had to save lots of money. <clears throat> And then we would finally get the money saved up to get it fixed, and the leak continued. It was just, we felt like we were knocking our heads against the wall. Like when your family members are sick, when they're very ill, you feel the same way. You just feel lost. You don't know what to do. You feel absolutely helpless. And God says, my grace is sufficient for you. And my power will be displayed through you and your responses and your dependence and your acceptance is what God needs to see. God created each and every one of you and me and God wants us to depend on him 100%. Not 20%, not 10%, not 50%, but 100%. He wants you to develop a Christ-like behavior, and that means your responses to whatever problem arises is significant because people will see Christ within you. Can you say see Christ in Paul? Can you? Of course you can. Paul accepted being imprisoned. He accepted torture. He accepted punishment, starvation. He accepted it all for Jesus. And once people started to worship Paul as God and giving sacrifices to Paul, Paul took himself out of that equation. He was a humble man. God wants all of us to take our problems, to take our challenges, and create something wonderful through dependence on Him. And let His power work through you so that people can see Jesus is there. This person is a Christian. It's obvious. I can see God in them. Sometimes we just want to cry. Sometimes we just want to blow up and freak out. Yeah, I've been there and been there. Sometimes we just want to sit and be depressed. Been there too. Been there in all those responses and none of them work. I can tell you right now, those responses do not work. I can promise you that. But if we accept this challenge and we pray and depend on you, God, not just pray for that challenge to be taken away from us. Not just pray for that thorn to be gone. Oh God, my, my schedule is so busy. I just want this to be resolved now, please. No, that's not going to be effective. Instead, say, my Father, my Father in heaven, help me to see clearly what I'm supposed to be doing. Help me to see clearly how to respond to these folks who are looking to me so that they will see Jesus. Help me to see clearly the lesson that I can learn from this situation. Help me to see clearly your love, your unconditional, unlimited love. Help me to see clearly how this experience will help me grow spiritually. That should be our prayer. We shouldn't be freaking out, we shouldn't be crying, we shouldn't be panicking, we shouldn't be depressed, we shouldn't be sitting in a corner. We need to be going straight to our Father and asking. And He'll be happy to show you His grace. God will show you what your life is supposed to look like. And when problems arise, 
as they will, every day, every week, every month, whatever they do, your response needs to be Christ-like. Don't let fear and anger and freaking out and tears come out. Put that aside. And remember that God's grace is sufficient and that you will be growing spiritually and you will be closer to God and I will too. And there are lessons that I will learn and I will trust and trust that you will take this negative experience and create something gigantic and huge in me. That needs to be our prayer. Amen and amen. Well, today is a day for the Lord's table, so I'd like you to... Um,